Hi, my name is Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to talk about arrays. Previously, I compared variables to buckets in the computer's memory that holds values. So to extend our analogy from earlier, you can think of an array as a bucket that contains other buckets. Another way to think of an array is a sequence of data. You declare an array just like you would any other variable. First of all, by giving it a data type and then also declaring how large or how many buckets you want there to be within your array. So then you can access any single item in that array, in that sequence, by using its index. That's how you index into a given element of an array, so to speak. All right, so what I want to do is create a couple of different examples of an array to fully exercise this idea and cement it in your mind. So as you can see, I've already created a new project called Understanding Arrays. Take a moment, create the project, catch up with me, pause the video if you need to, and then I'm going to begin typing in our first example. All right, so we just kept this first example very simple. Uh, I'll run the application so you can see what it outputs. It outputs the number 15. It says the third element of the array contains number 15. So this is where things get tricky and you have to just commit this to memory. Arrays are zero based, meaning that they always start, the first element is always the number zero, okay? So if you want to index into the third element of the array, you'll need to use the number two. So you can see how I've defined it here. The first element of the array, the array uses an index of zero, and we set that to equal to four. And so on with element one, two, three, four, and five. So there are five elements in our array that we've defined. To access a given element of the array, you use parentheses. So here I use the parentheses to set this element of the array to the value of 15, and here I'm retrieving that value by using the same index to access the third element of the array called numbers. All right, and we can do something like this as well. Let's extend our example here. All right, let's run the application. And you can see we printed out each of the elements of the array by using a for next loop like we learned about in the previous video. Here we are looping through each item in the array by starting with the number zero and then getting the length or we're asking how large is this array? It'll say five items. And since we're using this index value as the means of indexing into the elements of the array, we have to subtract one. The length will give us a number one, well, zero if there's nothing into it, but one if there's one item, two if there's two items, five if there's five items. But remember that each element of the array is zero based that accounts for the minus one. If we forget that, I'll just leave that off and rerun the example, we'll get an exception 
index out of range exception. The index was outside the boundaries of the array. So if we were to hover our mouse cursor over, index now is set to five because that's the length. And yet we don't have a fifth element or rather a sixth element of our array at index five. And that's why we get this exception. So we have to remember that the length is not the same as the number of, uh, or the, the boundaries of the array, okay? Likewise, what would happen if we attempted to add a sixth element into our array by using index five? What would happen? We would get a similar error, index out of range exception, because the index, again, five, is outside of the bounds of the array. So you just have to keep in mind that uh, arrays have boundaries. Once you define the number of buckets, so to speak, within your array, the number of elements within your array, it's fixed and you can't change it. Now, if you need that functionality where you need to expand or contract the size of your array, then the array is not necessarily the best container for your values we'll look at a fancier version of arrays when we look at collections much later in this series of videos, okay? Now, I used a longhand form for declaring or dimensioning our array. Typically, what you'll see is this, however. And all we do is just provide the upper boundaries. So we're still assuming the zero two we just give it the upper boundaries. Let's also comment this out to make sure that our example still runs, and it does. Great. All right, there's yet one other variation. I'm gonna select all of this and comment it out. And we can both declare and initialize our uh, arrays in one line of code. So let me show you how that's done. All right, so the syntax here is similar to what we've seen earlier, where we're setting uh, a initialization using the equal sign after we declare or dimension the variable. Notice two things. First of all, we're using these open and close curly braces to define the sequence of values that will be initialized to our new array. And then also, we don't have to set the upper boundary of the array. This will be inferred from the number of items that we are using inside of the initialization statement, okay? Let's go ahead and comment all of this out and move on. Up to this point, we've only showed the use of integers, but we can actually use any type inside of an array. So for my second example, All right, let's run this example just briefly here. So what did I do? A couple of things differently this time. You can see that I borrowed the uh, declaration and initialization um, technique that I demonstrated just a moment ago with the integers. This time we're using strings, however. So we're adding four elements to our new array. And then I'm using a different kind of uh, for next loop. This is the for each iteration statement. Here, I can iterate through each of the elements in an array. I don't care what their index values are. I'm just saying go through each item in the array. As you go through each item, pluck out the value for that element and stick it into a variable called name. Now, I'm going to retrieve the value and display it in this 
body of the code, console.writeLine name. And that's how it displays each of the names in sequence on a new line within my console window. Pretty cool. All right, and finally, let me do this. I'm gonna comment that out and go on to one last example here. All right, let me run the example just to make sure it works. Perfect. Okay, so what I did was this. First of all, I started off with a simple literal string. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their country. A historical quote, well known. Set that to a variable called my text. Now I use a method of the string data type called to char array. And a char is a data type that can contain a single alphanumeric character. And so what we want to do is split this entire string of, of characters into an array of individual characters, capital N, lowercase o, lowercase w, blank space, and so on. And we're going to set that as an initialization to a new char array or character array. Then I'm going to call a built-in function of array using the array data type dot reverse and passing in my new character array or char array. This will reverse the characters. So instead of the capital N being the first character in the array, it will be the last character in the array. Now I'm going to use the for each that we learned in the previous example to go through each character of the now reversed character array, printing out each character. Now I'm not using right line, I'm just using right, so there won't be a new uh, carriage return between each item within my array. I certainly could use right line, but then it would print it out in a, uh, in a vertical fashion rather than horizontally, and so that's what gives us this sequence which can now be read backwards. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their country, okay? All right, so in this lesson, we primarily learned about arrays as a means of managing or storing groups of data, like numbers or strings or any data type. Uh, along the way, we also learned a few other concepts and techniques. So back to arrays, uh, we learned a couple of different techniques for declaring them. The longhand form, a shorter form, here we declare and initialized all in one, uh, all in one sequence. Uh, arrays are zero based. If you attempt to access an array element outside the boundary of the array's length, as we found out through our looping example, and while we try to add an additional element to the array, we would get a, an exception about the uh, index being outside of the boundaries of the array. So we need to be uh, cognizant of that. We talked about the need to subtract one from the length property of the array so that we can get to just the number of items that are inside of our array. Uh, we also talked about the for each statement, which is a more convenient way, in my opinion, of accessing each of the items in an array. Uh, and then finally, you can call the array.reverse method to reverse the order of the elements in the array. And uh, there are quite a few other members that we didn't really talk about, but they allow you to perform other operations in, uh, on the data that is inside of your array. There's a lot more to say about arrays, but I think you're going to find that you'll use collections more often because there's even more utility to them. Like I said, we'll come 
back to the notion of collections a little bit later in the series of videos. So stick it, uh, stick with me, hang in there, and we'll get to that in just a little while. All right, see you in the next video. Thank you.